recording this. Okay, now I'm recording. Cool. All right. So, uh, so right. So we're talking about the height of the liquid remaining, uh, how fast it's dripping out when it's one inch. One inch. Okay. So this is kind of the picture we're working with. Um, let's see what kind of equations we're going to need for this. So um, one thing I always like to do when I'm doing related rates problems is sort of separate things into what I know, um, what I need, and what sort of equations I can use to relate them. So let's talk about the things we know. Most of it's encapsulated in the picture, but um, they tell us that height is 12 inches, diameter is 8 inches, um, and then the liquid trips at 2 inches cubed per second. OK, so that's kind of all we're given. So now we, what do we want? So we're looking for how fast the level of the liquid is dropping when it's one inch deep. So if, since they're saying how fast, what does that remind you of? What does that make you think? A rate of change, right? Mm -hmm. OK, so we're talking about a derivative, right? OK, so we're looking for the derivative of, so how fast the level, the level of the liquid is dropping. So we want the derivative of the level of liquid. When the liquid is one inch deep. When the liquid is one inch deep. Okay, so we should give this guy a name because this is the thing we want to find. So we'll write it as a function. Um, so if we want the level of the liquid, we can call that h for height, how high the liquid is. So what we really want is we want h prime, the derivative of h, when the liquid is one inch deep. So that would be uh, liquid is one inch deep. So we want h prime, and we want that to be a function of time, right? Because when we take the derivative, we want this to be in inches per second. So we'll call its variable t. So we want h prime of t when the liquid is one inch deep. So that would be when h equals one, I guess. OK. So uh, let's see. So the one rate sort of thing that we have right now is the liquid dripping at two inches cubed per second. So what kind of a derivative is that? What is that the derivative of? Well, spoiler alert, it is a derivative. But yes, exactly. So it's the volume. So. Um, since we have another sort of function of time, let's give it a name and say V of T is the volume of liquid in filter. Okay, so you just told me that the derivative of the volume is this number here. So let me just make sure. Yeah, so it's a constant rate. So it's always that. So V prime of T is equal to 2 inches cubed per second. OK. So this is pretty much everything we can possibly get out of the information given to us. And we've given everything names, which is good. Um, I can point to them, too. We can call this guy H of T. And then everything in here, that's V of T. That's the volume. Okay, so the internet connection is unstable. That's fun. Uh, I 
if anybody's having trouble watching, let me know. Because apparently the internet's not happy. But we'll just keep going. Let's see. Okay. So now we need our equations, which will relate the things that we have. That's why they're called related rates. We want to relate our rates. So we need something dealing with volume and something dealing with height, or this, this height in here. And I just marked that over here. And now it's over here, too. OK, so let's see if we can come up with some equation. Any guesses? Equation for the volume of the cone. Equation for the volume of the cone. I like that. So what is that equation for the volume of a cone? One third times the height times the area of the base. One third times the height times the area of the base. Cool. So, uh, so what's the area of the base in this case? What kind of a shape is the base? Circle. Circle. So all we're doing is the area of that circle, right? So we can replace that by 1 third h times pi r squared. Sound good? OK, so now we're almost there. We have an equation uh, in terms of v, in terms of h, but we have this r sticking out. So we have to get rid of the r somehow. So that's when we're going to need another equation. And let's see. So when we look at this cone up here, which is starting to get kind of messy. So we have this guy right here is h of t. And then we're saying r is the radius of this cone here. And so r changes with time as well, right? Because you can imagine that as the liquid drips down, this cone gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and r changes. So we'll say it's a function of time as well. OK. so. Now we need some way to get the radius in terms of the height. So any ideas there? Or some sort of equation that will relate radius and height. All right, so this one's a little trickier. Uh, this is where the hint might come in. So they tell us, recall the similar triangle property. So similar triangles are Triangles whose sides have the same sort of ratio to each other. So if you look, what we're actually dealing with is this sort of triangle right here. That's all we really care about. We don't care too much about the rest of it because uh, we're just trying to relate ra uh, the radius and the height. So, and if we look, this cone is inside this big cone here. And we actually have another triangle hiding out right here, something like this guy. So uh, we can picture that like this. We have this big triangle, and then inside that is the little triangle. They're both right triangles. Uh, and we know some information about both of these, right? We know that the diameter of this circle up here is 8, right? So if this triangle has uh, its top side like this, this would be the radius, which would be half the diameter. So we know that this radius up here has to be half of 8, which is 4. And then we also know we also know the height, right? They told us that at the very beginning, that the cone has a height of 12 inches. So this guy here is 12 inches. All right, so now we can also relate our, we can also put in what we have for this little cone, right? We said that the radius is here, and the height is there. OK, so now, like I said, similar triangles. Have um, the ratio of their sides the same. I don't know. Seems like there should be a better way to say that. Have same ratio of side lengths. OK, so what that means in this case is that the ratio of 12 to 4 is the same as the ratio of h to r, no matter how small this triangle gets, because it'll always be similar because it's kind of stuck inside there. They look the same, just one smaller scale down. So we know that 12 to 4 is equal to 
the height over here to the radius over there. So height over radius. All right, so this will give us our equation to relate the height and the radius, which is the last thing we need here, right? We have to fill out that R. So if we just simplify this down a little bit, we could say, well, 12 over 4, that's just 3. And then if we move the r to the other side, then we know that 3r is equal to h of t. OK, perfect. So we could actually right now just go through and plug in for r. Well, we could divide this 3 to the other side, plug in for r, and then make this guy only a function of each. But just for some practice, I won't do that yet. And I'll do it a little later. OK, so we know, so we want something dealing with h prime, right? And we have stuff in terms of v prime. So that tells us we should what? Perfect. So we want to get the derivative of both sides. Um, so let's differentiate this guy. So differentiate. So we know that. If we differentiate the left side, so we're differentiating with respect to time. So everything in here is a function of time. So we know that the left side should be v prime. And then the right side, well, we have to just differentiate this guy. So we have, let me rewrite this in a little bit nicer. So we can say that it's pi over 3 times h of t times r of t squared. Good. So if we want to differentiate, oops, sorry the derivative of that. OK, so this is now a function, or we want to differentiate two functions multiplied together. So what do we need to use when we do that? Product rule, perfect. So this may be kind of sneaky, because it doesn't look exactly like a normal product rule like we're used to something like you know, x cosine of x. You know, this you would know to use product rule, because this guy's a function of x and this guy's a function of x. These are a little more abstract, but they're still both functions of t that need to be differentiated separately using the product rule. So if we differentiate using the product rule, it's the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. So what we're dealing with here is so first h of t times the derivative of the second. And so we're going to have to use chain rule on this guy, right? Because it's a function squared. So it's one function inside another function. So it's like we pretend that this other function isn't here. We would use the product rule, bring this 2 down, and then the 2 would subtract to a 1. And then we want to make sure to put whatever was in here right here. And then we want to multiply it by the derivative of the inside. And the inside function is r of t. So we let that be r prime of t. So that was first times derivative of the second plus, now we want second, we can just leave that r of t squared alone, times the derivative of the first, which would be h prime of t. And you might remember it, first times derivative of the second plus second times derivative of the first. Oh, that's what I did. You can do it either way. It doesn't matter. It's addition. So it works either way. OK, cool. So now we know we have an equation with v prime. We have an equation with h's, r's, r primes, r's, and h primes. So what we really want here is we want to solve for h prime at the end, right? OK, so all we have to do is just plug in for everything else and solve it. So what we're looking at is, OK, well, we know we want the final thing OK, well, let's start with, let's just start and see what we can get. So uh, use highlighter side notes. So v prime, uh, that was one of those quantities we knew, right? They told us that the liquid drips at a rate of 2 inches cubed per second. We said that was equal to v prime. So we can just substitute that in. Say this guy is 2, and then go on over here. All right, so and when did we want the derivative of the height. Does anybody remember? I think we wrote it up here. We wanted h prime when h is equal to 1. So anywhere we see an h, we can plug in a 1 now, right? So h should be 1 times 
2 times r. OK, so what is r going to be when h is 1? Well, we have this equation here that will help us determine that, right? So when h is 1, I can plug in a 1 over here. So, let's see. so h equals 1 implies that we have 3 times r of t is equal to 1. So if we divide that 3 to the other side, we get that r of t has to equal 1 third. OK, so we can plug in for r. That'll be 1 third. And then times r prime of t. Well, we don't know r prime yet. I don't think we have any equations to figure that out. So for the time being, I'm just going to leave that. Uh, and then we'll keep going. So then we have another r squared. So that's a 1 third times or one third squared, right? So we took that one third up there and plugged it in there. And then times h prime. And h prime is what we want. So we don't want to fill it in. So we want to solve for that at the very end. OK, so we're in the home stretch here. All we have to do is figure out what r prime is. Now, when we're not sure, we have this equation, remember, right back up here, relating r prime and h, or sorry, r and h. So if we want to figure out an equation relating r prime to something we know or we want, we can just differentiate that equation, just like we did with the volume one before. So if we differentiate, we get that 3 r prime is equal to h prime. Everybody good with that? Cool. So now we can just plug in for r prime. Uh, sorry. So if we divide that 3 to the other side again, we get that r prime is equal to h prime, oops, h prime over. So we can plug that guy in right there. We know that 2 is equal to pi over 3 times 1 times 2 times 1 third times lots of times here. So h prime over 3 plus 1 third squared times h prime. And I'm kind of coming and going with these h prime of t stuff. It's, it's helpful to remember that things are functions of time. Uh, sort of at the beginning, sort of to say which things you know are functions of time, it, it's good to keep that in your head. But when you're doing algebra, it's annoying to keep the of t around. So sometimes I'll just write the letters. Okay, so all you have to go through now is just uh, solving this equation for h prime, which hopefully shouldn't be too bad. You can just factor this h prime out and then uh, divide all of that, all the other junk to the other side. And then, and also this. 3 over pi, move that to the other side, and you can solve for h prime. And that, I think, is the answer. Is they're going to want, so let's go back and check. What do they want? They want h prime of t when h is equal to 1. And so I think that's what we're going to get. So we good with that? Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah, so the key is just kind of writing down all the information you know, uh, writing down what you want. And then just finding equations to relate the things together. So in this case, we knew that the volume of a cone was going to be important because they talked about volume and we're dealing with a cone. So that's how we got this guy. And for the other one, well, that might have been a little less obvious, but they gave us a hint to think about similar triangles. And that comes up with cones a lot. So there might be other cone problems where that could be useful. Uh, and once you have those guys, you just you know, work with the equations you have and eliminate out any variables you don't know. And that should be that. So, cool. All right, so now I'll try and take a question from somebody watching online if they have any questions. If you do, uh, can you try using the, the hand raise thing? It's in the participants section. If you go to that, you can click raise hand. And the first person if, that raises their hand, I'll ask them what their question is. If none of you have questions, that's fine. I can just see if anybody else here does. But anybody? Nobody has any questions. How many people do we have? We have eight people. All right. Well, I'll assume that means you have no questions you feel like asking, or you can type them in the chat or whatever if you have any. Um, yeah. OK, so. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have a question in the class right now. And the question is, so what would, where would we go from here? Is that kind of what you're saying? Or how to get the H prime by itself? Okay. So the idea is that we have an H prime here and an H prime here, right? Uh, everything I'm drawing is going away. Why is this? Why is this happening? Okay, there we go. That's better. So uh, really what we're dealing with is kind of something, uh, if we simplify this down a little bit more, it looks like pi over 3 times, well, 1 times 2 times 1 third times 1 third. That's going to be 2 over 9 h prime plus, and then here we just have another, we have a 1 ninth h prime. Uh, so you, you can factor out the h prime if you want. We can actually just add these as fractions too, because they're both h primes and it's the same thing. So what I was saying is we do, we have the 2 ninths plus 1 ninth, and then we've factored out the h prime. Does that make sense? Uh, you don't have to. We can actually add these guys together. So we don't have to, sorry for the people online, we don't have to distribute this pi over 3. We can add these together actually because they're nice. They're a nice little fraction. So we get uh, pi over 3 and then we get 2 plus 1, that'd be 3 over 9. And 3 over 9 would be 1 third. So it's actually just times 1 third h prime. And that would just be pi over 9 h prime. And then we just have to get the pi over 9 on the other side. So negative, pi. negative pi over nine. Negative pi over nine. Why do you say that? Um. So, why would you say negative? Oh, do you, so okay. So to move it to the other side, we're going to use division instead of subtraction because we're multiplying here, right? Okay. So we want to divide. So what we, we want to divide both sides by pi over 9. So then remember we had this 2 way up there. So we want to divide this guy by pi over 9. And then these two will cancel. And then this will give us h prime is equal to 2 over pi over 9. And if we want to make that look a little bit better, we can multiply by 9 over pi down here and 9 over pi up here. That'll cancel those guys. And then these, this 2 and this 9 will multiply to give us 18 over pi. So I guess I kind of went through the whole thing here. But yeah. Does that make sense as to how we got there? So, so since we're multiplying this h prime times pi over 9, in order to get it to the other side, we had to divide by pi over 9. Sense, like, connect the context to the question. So it'd be. Okay, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so I was just going to get to this. Yeah, okay, so I'm glad you brought this up. So they're asking how fast is the level of liquid dropping, right? So you're saying it should be negative because it's leaving, right? Yeah. So this is actually kind of tricky. Um, what I really should have... So I kind of set this up as... When I said that the V prime here was equal to positive two, they told us actually that the two cubic inches was leaving the filter, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I were going the route where I say like, uh, because I said that, that this number is positive here and it's leaving the filter, what positive means in this case is leaving. So at the rate which it's dropping, so dropping is going to be positive in this case. Okay. So if they said, like, how fast is the level of liquid changing, that would be negative because it is kind of decreasing, right? But since they're saying how much is it dropping, that makes it a positive number, I think. I ran into this in the MLC, and I think it should be positive if it's not Try negative, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it should be positive. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because you, these get kind of tricky. So be be wary of how they word the question. Um, I originally thought that it should be negative as well, but it is how fast is the level dropping? So that will be a positive number. 
It's almost like if someone asked, like, how fast is that person moving backwards? You know? Yeah. You wouldn't say that they're going, like, negative five miles an hour backwards. But if they asked how fast is that person going and they were going backwards, then you would say negative five. It's, you know? Well, if we're talking about velocity, if we're talking about speed, then it's different. Which I guess that was another part of our homework this week. Okay, so does anybody else in here have any? Yeah. Um, homework thirteen. Homework thirteen. Two point seven. Number one. Okay, so this was 2.7, number one. Okay, so particle moves according to the law of motion. S is equal to T cubed minus seven T squared for T greater than or equal to zero, where T is measured in seconds and S in feet. So S is the position. S is always used for position for whatever reason. We can think about t as time. OK. So is there anything specific in this problem that was giving you trouble, or just the whole idea? Or? Um, I, I guess specifically, number, extra letter, 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 letter, extra letter, Yeah. So let's go through the whole thing uh, just to because these are common problems. These are very important problems. These are good problems to know. So yeah, let's go for it. Um, so they're asking for the average velocity over the interval 1 to 3. So average velocity. So what is velocity to position? Velocity is the derivative of position. So in general, velocity is like the change in position over change in time, right? It's the rate of change of position. So velocity equals change in position over change in time. So if they're asking for the average velocity, well, that's asking for the average rate of change. And that's something we did in the first week, I think. So that's where we were doing like the secant lines, um, finding the average rate of change. So that's a simple formula, and it's just you take the position at your end time and subtract by your position at your beginning time, and then just divide by you know, your change in time. So we say that change, so our final time is three and our starting time is one. That's our change, change in position over change in time. All right. Well, all we have to do now is just go into our formula and replace the s of 3 and s of 1 with the stuff in here. So what that's going to be is 3 cubed minus 7 t. Uh, sorry, so we're replacing the t's. We don't need that to be a t. We need that to be a 3 minus. And then now remember, we want all of s of 1. So it's very tempting right here to just put 1 cubed minus 7 1 squared. But remember, we're subtracting all of s of 1. And this whole guy is s of 1. So we want parentheses there. Otherwise, we may have missed that negative distributing to the second row. Uh, and then that's all just over 3 minus 1, which is 2. So uh, oops, and this should be a multiplication here. So that's just uh, some calculation. I won't do that. But so that's the idea of the average rate of change, or the average velocity in this case, because velocity is our favorite rate of change. And we have pretty much any example that's like 
rate of change, it's usually position, velocity, or acceleration. Yeah. So how come like the part end, how come you don't take the signal? Because they're asking the average velocity over the interval. So that's how you know. If they ask for inst oh sorry, so the question was for part A, why aren't we taking the derivative? Uh, and that's a very good question because you learn right away derivative of position is velocity. So the reason is because they were asking for the average velocity. Uh, and so that makes you think average rate of change, which makes you think, do this formula. If they asked for instantaneous velocity, that would be derivative. So that's the difference. And what we're kind of looking at here is something like, you know, here's the function. Um, the average velocity from one to three is the slope of this line. And you can also tell because they gave you an interval instead of at a point. If they wanted the instantaneous velocity at a point, well, that would look like, you know, if they wanted the instantaneous velocity at three, that would look like the slope of the tangent right here. So that's sort of the difference there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right. So now when they're asking for, that leads us well into part B, where they're asking for the velocity at time t. Now I know I just said they'll ask you for the instantaneous velocity, but at this point, the velocity at time t, well, they're asking for the velocity at one time, not over an interval. That should make you think, bam, derivative, instantaneous velocity. All right, so what they're really asking for is the velocity, which is, as I said, your favorite derivative, the derivative of position. All right, so all you have to do is differentiate. So this is another way to write derivative, which you should probably know by now. Um, so we want to differentiate t cubed minus 7 t squared. All right. I'm sure you guys are derivative masters by now, but just as some practice, remember this guy, we want to use the power rule. So that involves taking the three down and then subtracting one from the exponent. And then remember we can take the derivative of each of these guys separately because it's subtraction here. And we can leave that constant alone out front. We don't have to worry about it. So we can Leave that seven there, and then take the derivative of just this piece. So we'll bring the two down, and then two minus one up there. So if you want to simplify that, that's going to be three t squared minus uh, seven times two. It's going to be 14 t to the one. So we don't really need that there. And so that should be your velocity. Like that. All right, so now for part C, they're asking what's the velocity after two seconds? Well, that's not too bad. They're just asking for velocity at two. So all we're gonna do is just plug two into the formula we got right here. So three times two squared minus 14 times two. Again, that's just a calculation. Um, one thing we should also be aware of are the units. So even though the web work is very nice and gives us units, um, the exam may not be so nice to give you units, so it's good to know what has units of what. So, for example, since we have our position in terms of feet, and like we said earlier, velocity is change in position over change in time. So you know we should have the units of position up here, and then the units of time down here. So that's why we should have feet per second. Uh, so we got that for average velocity. We have the same units for instantaneous. And same thing down here. This guy's just going to be a number, but still in feet per second. And that's another way to check whether things are going OK is to make sure your units are good. Um, all right, so part D. So D is asking about acceleration now. So just like velocity should be your favorite derivative, Acceleration should be your second favorite derivative because acceleration is just the second derivative of position or the first derivative of velocity. So what that means is that um, acceleration, which we usually call A, is equal to the second derivative of position, which we can think about like S prime of T, and we're priming that, but we know S prime of T up here is the velocity. So that's actually equal to the velocity, the derivative. 
which we normally write like that. So if you want the acceleration and you're given a position, well, differentiate position twice. If you're given acceleration and you have velocity, well, differentiate velocity once. So let's not do more work for us than we need to. We have a function for a velocity right here. So let's just differentiate that guy, and then I'll give us acceleration. So acceleration is equal to v prime of t, which is equal to 3t squared minus 14t. We want to take the derivative of that. So just like before, product rule, or sorry, power rule, we want to bring the 2 down, and that will give us a 6, and then t to the 2 minus 1, which is just t to the 1. And then minus 14. So then if we, we can imagine we have a 1 here, so we can bring down the 1, and we get t to the 1 minus 1. Well, that's just 6t minus 14 times 1 is 14. And that's t to the 0. Anything to the 0 with power is just 1. So that's just a 1. So that's the acceleration function. All right, so now let's check our units. Let's pretend we don't see this yet. Um, so just like uh, velocity is change in position over change in time, acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. So what we really should have are the units of velocity, which we said earlier were feet per second, over the units of time, which are second. So if we want to make this look a little more pretty, we divide by, or multiply by 1 over s on the top and bottom, this cancels and we get feet per second squared. So that should be the units on velocity. Are they? Yeah, look at that, cool. Okay, so this gives us our velocity function, right? But what they're asking for is what's the velocity after seven seconds? Well, we'll just take our velocity function and plug in seven. 6 times 7 minus 14. That's just plugging in a 7 right there. And then that's just a calculation. Shouldn't be too bad. Um, all right. Now let's go on to part E. So part E is asking something a little bit more complicated. So for t greater than, z greater than or equal to 0, when is the particle moving in the positive direction? So this is like what we were talking about earlier, whether you're moving in the positive or negative or backwards or forwards direction. So in this case, it's very clear what they're talking about. They're saying we want to know when particle is moving in the positive direction. OK, so if you're moving in the positive direction, that means that your velocity is positive. So what we're looking for is when is v of t greater than 0. So. Let's go back to our formula for v of t. Well, we get this formula right here. So we know that v of t equals 3t squared minus 14t. We want to know when that's greater than 0. Greater than 0. So uh, in order to figure this out, the first thing you want to do is find the roots of this equation. So we want to find out, so when is v of t is equal to 3t squared minus 14t equal to 0. Well, this is a quadratic, um, and it's not even bad because we don't have a constant term. Constant. So we can just factor this t out. So what we get is t times 3t minus 14 equals 0. All right. Well, we know that either this has to be 0 or this has to be 0. So either t equals 0 or 3t minus 14 equals 0. And in this case, well, we just do a little algebra. 3t equals 14. We move the 14 to the other side. And then we move the 3 to the other side. And this would give us that t is equal to 14 over 3. All right, so these are the two zeros to the equation t equals 0 and t equals 14 over 3. So if we want to know when it's greater than 0, we want to do a little sine diagram. So we'll mark our points here and our point t equals. So 14 over 3 is 
uh, definitely positive, so it's going to go to the right of 0. And let's see, so 14 over 3 is about 15 over 3, a little less than 15 over 3, and 15 over 3 is 5. We know that 5 is over here, and we know, you know, 4 and all that jazz is over there. Okay, so if we want to know sign diagrams, uh, if we want to know when things are greater than 0, um, then we just plug in a point in this region, plug in a point in this region, and plug in a point out here. Uh, sorry. So these are the two that we're working with. So we want to plug in a point here and plug in a point here. Now, we could plug in a point back here too, but remember that they're asking for t greater than or equal to zero. So we don't actually have to worry about that. All right, so what's the easiest point to plug in from this section? One. Perfect. So we want to plug in 1 into what? V of t. Perfect. So we want to just plug in and say V of 1. So that's going to be 3 times 1 squared minus 14 times 1. 3 minus 14. Well, we don't really care what it is, but it is definitely negative, right? 3 minus 14. So we'll put a big old negative there. Okay, uh, and now we want to pick a point over here. So like I said, I think 5 is probably the easiest. You like small numbers. 5 is the smallest one that I can think of that's over here. That's a whole number. So if you plug in 5, we get 3 times 5 squared minus 14 times 5. That's going to be 3 times 25 minus 14 times 5. Um, I can do 3 times 25. 75, oops, or 77, 75, uh, 14 times 5, well, we can just do that multiplication, 0, 2, 5, 70, and that's just a positive 5, so we know that's positive. Again, we don't really care what number it is, we just care that it's positive. Okay, okay. so remember they were asking, when is v of t greater than 0. Well, we just want all points where it's positive, right? Because we're looking for positive direction, positive velocity. Um, yeah. So that would be all of these points. Uh, I guess all of these points out here. So everything bigger than 14 over 3. So in interval notation, we would say that that would be everything bigger than 14 over 3. So we go all the way up to infinity. Now, should this bracket here be open or closed? Should we use a parenthesis or a bracket? A parenthesis, why? Uh, because that's where it's 0, exactly. And so what they were asking is they want it in the positive direction. If v is 0, that means that you're stopped, right? You have no velocity. So that's not actually moving in the positive direction. That's just not moving at all. So yeah, so we wouldn't include that point um, in this case. Uh, yeah, so I think that that guy is your final answer. Ooh. That's your final answer. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I think the most important thing to take away from that is you have three quantities, position, velocity, acceleration. And you get from one to the other, differentiate. So position goes to velocity by differentiating. Velocity goes to acceleration by differentiating. And there's even more after that. After acceleration is jerk, I think is what it's called. You can think about it like that when you're like in a car and your acceleration changes just really fast, you like jerk backwards. So then I think they have like I think the ones after that are called snap, crackle, and pop, which is kind of fun. But no one ever uses anything other than acceleration that I've seen. Maybe. No, you don't worry about that. I've never. That's just like a little anecdote people tell. You never use it in real life. So. All right. So for those of you watching online, is there anybody that has a question you'd like me to go over? Uh, feel free to raise your hand or 
since nobody's talking at all, you could just unmute yourself and ask me yourself, or put it in the chat, or whatever. If nobody has any questions. Okay, Thomas has a question. Yeah, so I was just wondering, like, do you have any idea, like, what kind of problems we should expect on the uh, open answer questions? Okay, so on the open answer questions. So, those are things where we're going to want to see sort of some more of your working and stuff that's hard to answer in multiple choice. So, um, let's see. I think, in general, if you can come up with like a more involved type of problem, that's probably what you're going to be looking at. Um, or something where the final answer doesn't matter so much as the work. So, um, sorry I'm being a little cagey there. I don't know if I want to give away too much. But, yeah. There are problems where like web work kind of has to like hold your hand through the process to know you're doing all the work. If it's a problem like that, that's likely something that can show up. Because um, those are hard to check through multiple choice. Yeah, I'd say that. Um, so we also have some, let's see, so we have some people in the chat asking for questions. So 2.8 problem 8, 2.8 problem 4, and 2.9 problem 4. Let's go, let's start with 2.8 problem 8. I want to make sure I cover all the sections too, so let's see. So this is 2.8. Have I done 2.8 yet? Is that related rates? Or is that implicit? Okay. 2.8. Um, let me let me skip to 2.9 for a second, just so we can get some implicit stuff. Uh, and I'll come back to the other one, I promise. 2.8. Uh, 2.9, I just said. Number four, was it? Number four. Let me go fetch that. Oh, this is linear approximation. OK, that's good, too. All right, yes, I like this problem. This is a good problem. I don't know. I don't think so. I'm not sure. I am recording it. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to use the recording or not. We haven't really talked about it. Um, we're going to record it for posterity's sake. But if, I don't know, if there's a big demand for it, maybe we can try and put it up. I'll, I'll see how involved that is. I'll let you know. OK. Um, cool. So 2.9 number 4. We we're talking about the function f of x equals cosine pi over 6x. Find the linearization of f of x at the point x equals 1. OK. So if we want to do that, we know our formula for linearization is the linearization of a function at a point is equal to, well, let's say we forgot the formula. I like to usually think about this like I'm uh, trying to, okay, so Okay, so what we're dealing with, with with linearization is we have a function like this. And we want to get the equation of this line right here. Well, if we need an equation of a line, let's use point slope form. So we can say that y minus y1 is equal to m, where m is a slope, times x minus x1. In this case, y is the point on the line, which is actually equal to the linearization. I'm just going to substitute that guy in there. OK, and now we need a point on the line. Well, the only point we know on the line is the point where it's tangent. So that point would be x, f of x, where x is given to you. And that's where your linearization is. 
So in this case, we would want L of x minus f of x, which is 1 here, is equal to the slope. And so the slope of the tangent line, well, hopefully that's been hammered into your head. That's the derivative. And we want that slope at that point. Uh, times x minus, and then x1 is the point 1. Good. So then if we want to just wiggle this around a little bit, because they want it L of x equals something, so then we move this guy to the other side, and we get f prime of 1 is x minus 1 plus f of 1. So that should be, and uh, if we remember in general, the equation for linearization is, you know, f prime of a times x minus a plus f of a, where a is the x point you're linearizing around. Okay, so all that means is we just have to differentiate to get our f prime and plug in to get our f of 1. So let's differentiate this function here. So f prime of x is equal to, well, this involves a little bit of chain rule and a little bit of tree. So if we want to do chain rule, remember, so this one's kind of easy to pick out the inside function. That would be that little bit. And the outside function is cosine. So chain rule, we want to do the derivative of the outside with the inside plugged in. So what's the derivative of cosine? Negative sine. Perfect. So negative sine. And we want to plug in the inside, which would be pi over 6 times x. All right, times the derivative of the inside. Well, the derivative of the inside is pi over 6 times x, so we just get rid of that x. We want to use the power rule. We can think about it like pi over 6 times x to the 1. We drop the 1 down, and we get x to the 1 minus 1, which is pi over 6. So that's just a little constant that hangs out up front. All right, so that's f prime of x, but we wanted f prime of 1. So all you have to do is plug in 1 here. We get uh, f prime of 1 is equal to negative sine of pi over 6 times pi over 6. All right, sine of pi over 6. Ugh, we have to do trig. Lucky for you guys, on the formula sheet on the midterm, your special trig values will be on there. If you haven't seen the formula sheet, you can go to the, the homepage, and it will be, I think it's in the useful links section. You can click midterm formula sheet and it's all on there. That's what you're going to have for the exam itself. But uh, if you don't feel like looking over to the formula sheet and you remember your unit circle, well, let's see. So pi over 6, that's going to be this little one over here. I like to think about that like, oh, well, sine is sort of shorter here than it would be up here. That means that sine has to be the smallest one of our special values. So that's going to be 1 half. So that would be negative 1 half times pi. 6, negative pi over 12. Good. So we filled in for this little bit. Now we just have to fill in for that little bit, and we'll get our linearization. So f of 1, well, we go back to our function f of x here, and we just plug in 1. So f of 1 is equal to cosine of pi over 6. Ah, okay. Well, now we need the x value over here, and that one's far out. So that's how I remember special value should be root 3 over 2, or 3, root 3 over 2. We want our biggest one. So we go root 3 over 2, root 2 over 2, and then 1 half is biggest and smallest of the special values. So root 3 over 2. All right, so if we plug it in, we get that L of x is equal to negative pi over 12 times x minus 1 plus root 3 over 2. If you really wanted to, you could distribute this guy through, but don't worry about it. Looks fine how it is, and yeah, I'm good with that. All right, so that's the linearization of this function. So now might be a little bit of a harder question. We want to use this linearization to estimate the value of cosine 5 pi over 24. So I'll pull that over there. Okay, so we want to get an estimation for cosine 5 pi over 24. They say we should use part A. Okay, so what we really want to do is get approximately 
uh, we really want to get this using the linearization. So what we should think about is what x value do we have to plug in here to get cosine 5 pi over 24? And then we'll take that x value and plug it into the linearization instead. Because the linearization is a lot easier to work with than cosine. A lot of cosine stuff, like you can't come up with a cosine value that isn't one of the special values, right? Those are just, it's, it's hard to do. And very, rare, very rarely are they actually like good numbers. So uh, if we want to come up with the x value that we have to plug into f of x to get 5 pi over 24. So we want cosine of 5 pi over 24 to equal cosine of pi over 6 times x for some x. So what is this? Well, we just want this value in here to be equal to this value in here. So we can set those guys equal and say 5 pi over 24 is equal to pi over 6 times x. And then it's just, you know, algebra. It's all for x. So we can divide both sides by pi. We can divide both sides by, or sorry, multiply both sides by 6. That would turn this guy to a 4 down here. And we get that x has to equal 5 over 4. So we know that x should be 5 fourths. And just as a little bit of a check, um, it won't you know, tell you whether you're right or wrong. Usually, if you want to use the linearization to approximate the value of a function, you should really only plug in values that are close to the point that you linearized around. So we linearized around x equals 1. That means we linearize you know, maybe right here, x equals 1. But we should only plug in x values on the line that are close to x equals 1, because then they're close to our function as well. If we plug it out an x value way out here, well, then the function's going up here, and it may not be close at all. So in this case, 5 fourths is pretty close to 1, so we know we're on the right track. OK, so now all they're asking for is find the linearization at that x value. That would be 5 fourths in here. We just plug this into minus pi over 12. And then we get a 5 fourth minus 1 plus root 3 over 2. And hey, if you just want to plug that in, the web work can take it. If you want to make it look a little nicer, you could simplify this guy down, minus pi over 12, 5 fourths, and then 1 could be 4 fourths. So 5 minus 4 is 1, so that's just a 1 fourth. Plus root 3 over 2, minus pi over 48, plus root 3 over 2, and there's not much more we can do from there. So I'd say that that's what they're looking for for that guy. All right, any questions about that problem specifically? Does that make sense to everybody? OK, cool. Now I'm going to go back to that one I said I would. 2.8 problem 8. And I'll leave that for 2.8 number 8. Let me go get that. All right, so this is the street light one. Okay, so a street light is at the top of a pole that is 12 feet tall. A woman six foot tall walks away from the pole with a speed of three feet per second along a straight path. How fast is the length of her shadow moving when she is 25 feet away from the base of the pole? Okay, so related rates, draw a picture. So we can... This will be my, my beautiful street lamp because it's shining light. Uh, and they say that this street lamp is 12 feet tall. Oops. A woman six feet tall walks away from the pole with a speed of three feet per second along a street path. Uh, OK, and they want how fast is the length of her shadow moving when she's 25 feet. So just for the sake of the picture, put 25 feet between her and the pole. And we have a nice little person here. 
uh, and she is six feet tall. Speed of, and she's walking at a speed of three feet per second. Right. So remember again, we know we have speed, so feet per second. Change in distance or we change in time. Okay, so I think this is most of the information we have. Uh, now let's go into, we'll reiterate it. Um, we'll put it into our no column. So uh, let's give some of these things names. So what they're asking for at the end is how fast is the length of her shadow moving? So we're also going to have her little person shadow, right? So maybe it looks something. Uh, and that's being cast by the uh, the street lamp. So uh, let's give. So the things that are changing are um, the length of the shadow. So let's give that a name. We'll just call it L. And remember, it's changing with respect to time. So we give it a time. Uh, we say it's a function of time. Um, her distance away from the street lamp is changing, right? She is moving at a speed of three feet per second. So let's call this guy S of T, her position, maybe, away from the street lamp. So we know that, uh, so let's turn things in the picture into mathematical statements. So we know that she's moving at a speed of three feet per second. So that means that her change in position over change in time, her instantaneous velocity, her derivative of position, is equal to three, always, since it's constant. Uh, yeah, so it doesn't really actually change with time, but her position itself does. Um, and yeah, other than that, let's just, we can go back to the picture for some of these nice quantities. So let's see what we want. Well, we want how fast is the length of the shadow moving when she's 25 feet away from the base of the pole? So the length of the shadow here is what we want, but we want how fast it's changing. Uh, how fast is it moving? So that should be an indicator that we're dealing with a derivative, a change. So we want L prime of t when her position is 25 feet away from the pole. Well, that would mean that S of t should be 25. So when S of t equals 25. Uh, and I think that's all we really want. So. Now we need to come up with our equations to relate things. Um, so, let's see. The first thing that stands out to me again is I drew a little triangle here from the tip of her shadow to the tip of her head, um, and then that guy's the length of the shadow there. And then that tallest line is gonna be the light coming from the shadow, right? Because this light that touches her head is gonna be the light that casts the tip of the shadow. So that's how we know that that's gonna be the length. If I drew this little triangle inside of this big old triangle over here, right? It goes from the street lamp all the way to the tip of the shadow. So that reminds me a lot of the last problem where we were doing similar triangles. When you have one triangle inside another, you know that they're similar. So let's see if we can come up with something like that. Um, so on this triangle, the side is L, and or this side is L, and this side, well, we know it's the height of the woman. It's six. On this triangle here, this side is her position plus the length of the shadow. And on this side, well, we know that's a fixed, that's 12. Let's start with these sides. We say that the ratio of this side to this side, so this side down here is S plus L, right? Because we get S over here and L over here. So it'd be 12 over S plus L is equal to, and then that would be this side over this side. So that would be the fixed six feet over the length of the shadow. That seem okay to everybody? All right. So now if we were to do some derivatives over here, well, we'd end up getting some L primes. Well, that's what we want. We'd also end up getting some S primes. 
but we know what S is. So we're pretty much set. Uh, the only thing I can anticipate us needing is maybe what S itself is. Well, we have that. And what L itself is. And we don't have that yet, but we could use this equation to get it. So first off, uh, let's differentiate. Um, in a problem like this, you could go through differentiate both sides, but it looks kind of gross. So I'm going to move this guy to the other side and this guy to the other side. So everything's on top and we don't have to deal with negative exponents and it won't look as bad. So we'll get that this guy is 12L is equal to six times S plus L. And you know I can do some simplification actually, distribute that six and we get 12L is equal to 6s plus 6l. I can move this 6l to the other side and subtract both sides by 6l, and we get that 6l is equal to 6s. Well, I can just divide those 6s out too. We get that l is actually equal to s. That's pretty neat, right? So the, her distance away from the lamp is actually equal to the distance of her shadow, or the length of the shadow. So we want to differentiate, yeah. So I have a different number. Uh-huh. So I get I equals 6s. 4L equals, okay. So something like 4L equals 6s. That's what you have? Yeah. Okay. So same thing. It's not too big a deal. Um, you can just divide both sides by one of them and get 4 over 6L is equal to s. It's all right. Just carry the constant through. Don't worry about it. Yeah, so the question was, uh, on this person's specific web work, they got a different constant. They had four and six. Um, I guess I left out, and on mine I got ended up with six and six, so it was canceled. But if you have something like that, well, just carry that constant through. Don't worry about it. Constants aren't too, too big a deal. Um, it makes the math a little bit worse, minutely. It's not that bad. Uh, OK, so for here, well, we know this equation. That's a good equation. We like that one. So. Now we want something involving L primes, so let's just differentiate that. So L prime is equal to S prime. We just differentiate both sides. Well, I mean, they already, we already know what S prime is, right? It should be three. So L prime is equal to three, and that's all. Uh, we didn't even have to use the fact that she was 25 feet away. So yeah, uh, this one simplified out pretty nicely. Um, for example, if we had something like this, though, over here, uh, well, what we really want is L by itself, so we can get L prime by itself. Maybe I'll actually move that guy to the other side and say that L is equal to 6 over 4 times S. Then we can differentiate both sides. And again, you know, plug in whatever S prime is, which was 3 in our case. And L prime is then a little bit different, but not too much. So hopefully... That makes sense. Um, and if you notice, this was a rather involved type of question, one where it would be kind of hard to see a multiple choice answer. So, you know, if you think about involved types of questions and which kinds of questions will be where on the exam, well, who knows? But. All right. So we had another one. Let's see. Is there anybody here that has a question? Yeah. It was on uh, number 13 number 5. 13 number 5. Let's see. What time is it? It is. Come on. I have a watch. 7.45. Okay. Okay, homework 13, number five, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. I like these velocity problems. These are nice. Uh, so this section is kind of just giving you a taste for what calculus is good for. It's good for some applications. Lots of stuff involving rates of change and lots of physics is rates of change. Uh, okay, so we were doing 2.7 over 5. Uh, gonna... 
2.7, number 5. Okay, so the position function of a particle is given by this little cubic, uh, where s is measured in meters and t in seconds. Uh, so find all values of t greater than or equal to 0 for which the particle is moving at a velocity of 7 meters per second. And remember again, oh, you know, how about, I didn't do it up here, but uh, keep in mind that we're going to have, what happened to number four? Uh, did I skip one? Um, are you talking about 2.9 number four? Someone asked about number four. 2.8. Uh, did I not do 2.8 number four? Did I mess up what I was doing? Did I do, do, oh, I did 2.9 number four and then 2.8 number eight. What was I doing? Okay, so 2.8 number eight, and I did 2.9 number four. Okay, I'll go back to 2.8 number four right after this one. Um, so this one should be quick. OK, yeah. 2.8, let me keep that in mind. 2.8 number 4, I think that's what we're talking about. 2.8 OK, yeah. I'll make sure to do that one next. Um, OK, so right. Like I was saying, up here for this one, I didn't come up with the units. Again, WebWork gave me the units, but we may not always have WebWork to give us the units. So they were asking, how fast is length changing? So length with respect to time, that would be feet. Oh, I just scribbled through that. Feet with respect to time. So this would be feet per second. And that would be what WebWork asked for us. All right. So we saw in this one, again, velocity in terms of seven meters per second. OK, so they're asking for all the times when the particle is moving at a velocity of seven meters per second. Well, what that means to me is first I should figure out what the velocity function is, right? And if I want velocity from position, again, just differentiate. So s prime equals v equals, all right, so again, we're just going to do power rule. So bring that 3 down, subtract by 1, bring the 2 down, subtract by 1, bring that 1 down, subtract by 1. So we're looking at 2 times 3 times t squared minus 15 times uh, 2. Uh huh. Okay, so the question is uh, what's our end goal here? Why, why are we taking, why are we trying to find velocity? Well, they're asking when, find all values of t for which the particle is moving at a velocity of 7 meters per second. So we're not going to plug 7 into the velocity, because things that go into the velocity are times, right? And so they're looking for a velocity of 7. So what we're going to do, um, hold on. Something weird just happened. OK. Uh, I wonder if my how my battery is doing. Uh, I'm going to put this on the charger. Um, OK, so we're not going to plug in 7 for velocity, but that's going to be what our velocity is equal to. So what we're going to do is we're going to set it equal um, at the end. So we're going to find the velocity and say velocity equals 7, and then solve for times where that happens. OK, so it'll turn into an algebra problem. Yes, that's a good question. It's very hard to keep in mind what's going where. You know, who's, who goes in which function and what time means and what velocity means. So keep in mind that times go into this velocity function. You get the velocity at a certain time. So. Okay, cool. So, right, so we were differentiating this and we came up with, so we had the 15 times the 2 times the t minus 29, and the t just turns into t to the 0. All right, so if we want to simplify this down a little bit more. So we know we're going to be manipulating this equation a little bit, so we'll, we want to keep it as simple as possible. So we put 6t squared minus 30t minus 29. OK. 
Okay. So now they're asking, when is the velocity 7? So all I want to do is take velocity and plug in 7. So I want to say 7 is equal to the velocity, which is this function here. t squared minus 30t minus 29. And I want to find those t's that will give us 7 for the velocity. Right? All right. So I just want to solve this like a quadratic equation that we're used to. Um, in order to get it really like what we want, we usually like 0 on this side. I'll move the 7 over to the other side. So I'll subtract 7 from both sides. This will give us that 0 is equal to 6t squared minus 30t. And then if I subtract 7 from that guy, that will give me a minus 36. Oh boy, lots of 6 stuff going around. Um, so you can try factoring from here if you want. I usually, if I have a constant out front and uh, everything in here is divisible by that constant, I usually like to pull it out. So in this case, I'll pull out the 6 just to make it like something I'm used to. So t squared, and then if I pull a 6 out of here, that turns into a 5. Right? 6 times 5 is 30. And then for this guy, uh, 6 times 6 is 36. All right, now this guy is looking a lot easier to factor. So uh, I would have a a negative 6 and a positive 1, t minus 6 times t minus plus 1. That would give me, if I add these two guys, I get a negative 5. If I multiply these two guys, I get a negative 6. So we're looking for when this is equal to 0. So either this guy has to be 0 or this guy has to be 0. That means that t either has to be a negative 1 to make this guy 0 or positive 6 to make this guy 0. So find all values of t. Oh, they were asking only for greater than 0. So we can get rid of this negative guy. So t equals 6 is the only one. Yeah. So the, OK, so what about this 6 out front? Um, does this matter? Well, what? we're actually looking for is when is this guy, this whole expression equal to zero. So for this expression to be equal to zero, either this thing has to be equal to zero or this thing has to be equal to zero. Uh, the six doesn't actually matter. And it, to show that, we could actually divide both sides by six, right? Even just get rid of it. So that would mean that we would have zero over six is equal to t minus six times t plus one. And zero over anything is just zero. So, yeah, when you're finding zeros, it doesn't matter. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. There are cases where that six will matter. And maybe, you know, if I had a one over here, that would be important. Um, but then I wouldn't be factoring, or that would be a little different of a situation. OK, good. OK, so now we're going to go back to that one that I said we were going to do. And that was 2.8 number 4. Point eight number four. 2.8 related rates number four. All right, spherical balloon. Okay, if this is the wrong problem, please tell me. Uh, I want to make sure we got the right thing. Okay, so we have another request later. All right, so spherical balloon, you're blowing air into a spherical balloon at a rate of 11 cubic inches per second. Given that the radius of the balloon is four inches when t equals one seconds, answer the following question. How fast is the radius of the balloon growing at t equals one second? What is the rate of change of the surface area at t equals one second? All right, so we're looking at kind of two different problems here, um, but we can get the setup the same. So again, we can have a picture. This one might be one where it's not so useful to have a picture, but we'll try it. Let's see what we get. So we have something like a balloon that's a sphere. It's a very nice looking sphere. Um, so the radius of the balloon is four inches. 
and air is being blown into it. So all that's happening is this balloon is getting bigger and bigger and less spherical for some reason. But yeah, so that's pretty much all we're given. We're, giving, we're given that the air is going into it at a rate of 11 inches cubed per second. So what that means is that if air is going into there, that means that that air must be turning into volume on the inside, right? And we especially know that it's volume because we have this cubed factor here. Anytime you have something cubed, that's volume. Um, so we know that volume is increasing. Let's write down what we know. We know that the change in volume, uh, so the volume of the balloon is changing, so we know to make that a function. And we know that it's changing at a rate of 11 inches cubed per second. Uh, we also know that the radius is changing, uh, but we don't know how fast. That's what we're looking for. Uh, so we want to make sure to give that a name because we know that it changes with respect to time, uh, but we won't put it in our no column. Uh, so let's talk about what we want now. So we want how fast the radius is changing. So that's where we want our r, uh, and we want it changing. Change means derivative. So r of t. And when do we want it? We want it when t is equal to 1. So in this case, they're not giving it to us in terms of another quantity. Like, for example, the streetlight one was, when is, what is her shadow, what rate is her shadow changing when she's 25 feet away from the pole? This time, they're giving us a time. So the shadow one, they didn't ask us when time is equal to 12. This one, they are saying, when time is equal to 1. Um, that's maybe a little different. But uh, so that's what we want, that's what we have. So now we have to come up with an equation to relate those two variables. All right, does anything stand out to us? I'll just say I think that anytime you have a volume involved, just write down the equation for whatever volume this thing is. So it's a sphere, so we want the volume of the sphere. The volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Uh, and that should be on the formula sheet. All these volumes should be on the formula sheet that you can check. Okay, so now, like I said, well, what are we going to want? We're going to want the um, – oh, shoot, we actually do know something. We know that the radius is 4 inches when t equals 1. So we actually can put that in our thing. We can say that r at time equals 1 is equal to 4. That's what we have up here. Let's just keep that in mind. Okay, so if we have something about v primes, we want something in terms of r primes. We have this big equation down here. Let's differentiate it. So if we differentiate this side here, well, we leave the constants alone, 4 thirds, pi, pi is still constant, even though it's a weird one. Uh, we'll bring down the 3, turn it into an r squared. And then remember, r is a function of time. So this is actually a little chain rule going on. Uh, so we know we should have r prime times that. Uh, we're not differentiating with respect to r, we're differentiating with respect to time. And then we can say this guy is equal to b prime. All right, so now we can just kind of plug stuff in. We know that r of 1 is equal to 4. So we can plug in for this guy, turn that into a 4. We know v prime is equal to 11. So we can just say that 4 pi, sorry, 4 thirds pi times 3 times 4 squared times r prime is equal to 11. And that would mean if we solve for r prime, it would just be 11 over all that. On the left hand side, 4 pi 3 times 4 squared. So then you can just do that math. And uh, to double check, well, what are we doing? We're doing a radius. Radius is a length. So length in terms of inches. But we made sure to, we took the derivative. So that's change in time. So inches over seconds. And just to double check with web work, they tell us that they wanted, okay, stop, stop going away. They wanted it in inches per second. Yep. Um, what, so what are you plugging for? Uh -huh. Is it at time one, though, like so time yes, exactly. Okay, so uh, the question was, I plugged in four, but they wanted it at time one, right? 
All right, well, if I wasn't sloppy here, I would have written out all of the of t's, right? But I would have said that 4 thirds pi times 3 times r of t squared times r prime of t is equal to v prime of t. And right, you're asking, you said they wanted a time 1. So for all the t's, I should plug in 1. So then 4 thirds times pi times 3 times r of 1 squared times r prime of 1 is equal to v prime of 1. All right, so we're about to get r prime of 1 if we solve this out, which is what we want. We want r prime when t is equal to 1, which is r prime of 1. But we need to plug in for r of 1. But r of 1 up here was 4. So that's why we plugged in a 4 there. Uh, and that's why for, we wanted v prime of 1 as well. Well, v prime of t, well, that's always just 11. It never changes. Um, so then we could just plug in 11 for that. And so it's just finding it for just one second. Exactly. I was finding, yes, that's a good point. I was finding it for one second. So how fast is the radius of the balloon growing at t equals one second? And even if I found it at t equals one second, that's still instantaneous. That may not be the same at t equals 1.5 seconds. It would be the same at t equals half a second. This is when t is equal to one, how fast is it changing? All right. What was that? Uh-huh. This guy here? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yep, it's that four inches that's right here. And that goes right there. So I know it looks a little strange with the units. We have inches on top here. But it's actually going to cancel. If I carry, if I wrote all the units through, I don't expect anybody to do that. But the units actually work out right. And you come out with inches or seconds. That's maybe something more for a, for a physics class. But it's good practice to try to. OK, so now we'll do part B. What's the rate of change of the surface area at t equals 1 second? So that's a little bit, of, that's a little bit different. Um, we found how fast the radius was changing. Now I want the surface area. So Uh, if we want something about surface area, well, let's first come up with the equation for surface area. We have all this information here, so let's uh, let's just skip through all that. Come up with the equation for surface area, and if I'm right, it should be four pi r squared. That's not right. Equals. We'll call that a for surface area. That's not right to everybody on the formula sheet somewhere. Uh, a sneaky little fact you may notice is that if you differentiate equations for velocity, you actually get equations for surface area. Because if you think about it, the rate of change of velocity, when the, or I mean, sorry, volume, when volume's changing, what you're doing is you're adding just a little tiny bit on the outside of this balloon. So that little tiny bit is almost the surface area. It's like you could imagine you're sticking a little shell on top of the balloon to make it a little bigger, and on that shell, that is the surface area. So that's a neat little, neat little trick there. Um, may not work for every situation, so use formulas if you're not sure. Okay, so this is the surface area, and we have this equation here. Well, we want how fast the surface area is changing, so again, let's differentiate. So if we differentiate both sides, We'll ignore the constant. This 2 comes down, and then we get uh, r to the 2 minus 1, that's just a 1, times, again, r is something that changes the time, so we need to make sure it has its derivative. We're differentiating with respect to time, not with respect to r. Uh, and that's just equal to a prime. And really, what we're looking for is a prime of 1 at the end. So because let's go back and double check. What is the rate of change of the surface area at t equals one second? So I want it when t is equal to one. So times r of one times r prime of one is equal to a prime of one. Well, let's see. I want this. I have this. That was one of these guys up here. r of one is equal to four. Oh, and I have this too. That was the answer to the last part. That was very nice of web work to help us out here. So all I would do is plug in the answer to the last part here, 
plug in four here, okay, and uh, then just multiply that out, and that would give us the answer for the change in surface area at t equals one. Does that make sense? I know we're going a little fast, but. Uh, if you want to check units too, all right, so area is changing now, area over time. So area is usually a squared, well, it's always a squared. So that would be whatever units we're working in, which is inches. Well, I'd have to put this over on the other side. So here, it would be inches squared, that would be the area per time, so inches squared per second. And if we want to double check, let's see what web work wants us. Square inches per second. Um, yeah, it's very easy to forget the units after web work gives them all to you, um, but really try your best not to. They're important to keep around, at least at the end. Maybe through, throughout calculations, don't worry about it. OK, it looks like we had another question from the chat. Let's see what we had. We had 2.7 number 8. Can we not do that? No. 2.7 number 5 and 2.7 number 1. OK. 2.7 number 8. 2.7 number 8. All right, a time t seconds. The position of the body moving along the s axis is that expression. And they even give us some nice units there in terms of meters. Uh, this m does not represent a variable in this case. Uh, so find the acceleration. Each time the velocity is zero, enter your answer as a list if necessary. Find the speed of the body each time the acceleration is zero, enter your answer as a list if necessary. Find the total distance traveled by the body from t equals 0 to t equals 2. All right. This is a, this one's a little bit more sophisticated than our others. So they're asking for a bunch of stuff. So they're saying uh, we're going to want acceleration. We have position, so we need to differentiate twice. Along the way, uh, they also ask us something about velocity. So we might as well find velocity, uh, and we'll get there anyway. So s prime is equal to v, which is the velocity. So we just have to differentiate this guy. And uh, again, that's product rule, uh, power rule, sorry. It's not too bad. So 3t squared minus 18t plus 15 not t. So that's velocity. And then if we want acceleration, that's the derivative of velocity, which is the second derivative of position. So we differentiate this guy up here, and we get 6t minus 8. Oh, dokie. So they want the acceleration each time the velocity is zero. So we want to find when is the velocity, whoops, when is the velocity equal to zero? Uh, loud noises. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so uh, if we want to find when the velocity is equal to zero, well, we just take our velocity equation and set it equal to zero. So v equals zero equals 3t squared minus 18t plus 15. All right, so there's another quadratic. Uh, like I said before, if everything is divisible by this guy out here, then I like to divide by it. So in this case, 3 is divisible by 3, 18 is divisible by 3, and 15 is divisible by 3. So how about I just divide both sides by 3? So like I did before, I factored out the 3, right? This 
This time I'm just going to divide by a 3, get it out of the way. It's not even going to stick around anymore. So this side turns into 0. And then this guy, or I guess it was a 6 last time. But, so this 0 over 3 goes to 0. And then I get a t squared minus uh, 18 over 3 is 6. And then 15 over 3 is 5. OK. And this guy is uh, just about the same to factor as the last, a little different. So we need things that multiply to positive 5, add to negative 6. Well, that's got to be negative 1 and negative 5. Good. So that means that velocity is 0 when, all right, when either this guy's 0 or this guy's 0 or this guy's 0, when this guy is 0, that means that t is equal to 1. When this guy is equal to 0, that means t is equal to 5. All right. So we found when velocity is equal to 0. But they wanted the acceleration each of those times. So all we have to do is find the acceleration at time 1 and time 5. So we can take our acceleration function here. And we want a of 1, a of 5. And again, that's just plugging 1 in here and 5 in here. And that'll be your list. So um, I can write that as a of 1, a of 5. So you can go through and plug those in if you want. All right, so that's part A. Part B. So find the speed of the body each time the acceleration is 0. Enter your list, answer is a list of necessary. OK, speed. So they bolded speed for us. Why did they do that? Well, that's because speed and velocity are different. Right? Do you know that? Yes. Uh, that's very important to remember. Velocity has a sign. So if your velocity is negative, that means you're going backwards. If your velocity is positive, you're going forwards. Um, speed, however, is always positive, and it's just the magnitude of velocity. So if I were going backwards at 15 miles an hour, my speed is 15 miles an hour, but my velocity is negative 15 miles per hour. That's the only difference. So if you have speed, they should always be positive. All right, so speed, each time the acceleration is 0. So we want to figure that out. Well, if a of t equals 0, well, our formula for a of t is over there. That would be 6t minus 18, so that I could move the 18 over here. And that would give me that 6t is equal to 18 divided by 6. That gives me that t is equal to 3. So what they really want is the speed at t equals 3. All right, well, I don't have a formula for speed, but I do have a formula for velocity. And speed is just the velocity without a sign. So I can just plug it in and find v of 3. And that's equal to uh, 3 times 3 squared minus 18 times 3 plus 15. Uh, now, this number might be positive, might be negative. I don't know. But if we really want the speed, we should take the velocity and take the absolute value. So no matter what we get here, make sure it's positive. And then that would be your answer here. Uh, so it would be, let's see, it's the absolute value of the velocity at 3. Uh, and we only got one point for that, right? We only came up with one time, so the list is not necessary. OK, so the last one. The last one is a little harder. Uh, find the total distance traveled by the body from t equals 0 to t equals 2. So they're asking for total distance traveled. What we have is a formula for the position of the body. What that might look like is you know, maybe something like that. So the body is you know, at a negative position over here, at 0 over here, at a positive position over here, positive, 0, stuff like that. Uh, the total distance traveled will be how far it moves in the process. So, uh, 
OK, so I got a question on the chat. It says, on the test, should we show every step when solving for t, such as 18 over 6? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, just show what makes sense to you. So I, no. If you wrote, like, if you wrote that a of t equals 0 uh, equals 6t minus 18, and then that gave us that 6t equals 18, and that gave us that t equals 3, I'd be fine with that. That's about as much work as I expect you to show. No need to do all the divisions and all that jazz. OK, cool. So total distance traveled. So in order to figure that out, what we want to do is we want to separate it into um, times when the when the particle is stopped. So if we find where the particle stops, so for example, if this is the position, then we know that the particle stops right here because it gets flat. So that means that it's a it's velocity, the slope of the tangent here is zero. And same thing down here. So if we know that it stops, we could figure out what point it is at, you know, maybe over here. What point it is here, this would give us, you know, maybe this is 5 and this is negative 2. Well, then we know it traveled from negative 2 to 5. So that means it traveled 5 minus negative 2, which is 7. So that means that in this little area, it traveled seven units. Um, and then from here to here, so this means that it stopped and then it turned around. So we, we can imagine the particle going like this. It goes up like this and then it stops and then it turns back around and then it stops again right over here and it turns back around. So what we really, we really want to add this distance, this distance, and this distance. So we need to separate it into all the times that it stops. So in order to do that, so find times when stopped, which is when the velocity is equal to zero, right? All right. Well, we already figured that out, right? We did that in part A. So when is the velocity equal to zero? At t equals 1 and 5. Or b. So that would mean that t is equal to 1 and 5. OK, so they're asking for the distance the body traveled from t equals 0 to t equals 2. So really, we should think about it like this. We should think about t equals 0 here. This is our t axis. Uh, t equals 1 here. We want to mark that because that's where it stops, and it may change position, or it may change direction. Sorry. Uh, and then 2, that's our stop. So we want to figure out our uh, position at each of these special points. So we want to find out s of 0, s of 1, and s of 2. And we don't have to worry about the 5, because they only want it up to 2. Oops. All right. Uh, just for sake of having it, let me write it again. S of t is equal to t cubed minus 9t squared plus 15t. All right. So if we just plug in here, we get that s of 0, well, 0 here, 0 here, 0 here. That's just going to be 0. s of 1 is equal to 1 cubed minus 9 times 1 squared plus 15 times 1, which is going to be 1 minus 9 plus 15, which is equal to 7. And then s of 2 is going to be 2 cubed minus 9 times 2 squared plus 15 times 2. And I just want to go through all these calculations so we can double check to figure out exactly how much distance has been traveled between each of these points. So we want 2 cubed, that's going to be 8 minus 9 times 2 squared. 2 squared is 4, 9 times 4, 36. 15 times 2 is 30. That's going to be 30 
minus 36, negative 6, 8, minus 6, 2. All right, so what we're looking at here is if this is the position over here, we went from 0 up to 7 and then down to 2. So we were up at 7 here and then down to 2 here. So it looks something like this. It's maybe something like that. Keep it smooth. But we know it has to be flat up here, right? Because we decided that the velocity, the times when it stopped, uh, that was t is equal to 1. So the distance traveled from this section to this section. Well, it went from 0 up to 7. So it traveled 7 here. And then it traveled from 7 to 2. So that means that it traveled 5 units of distance. Even though it went from 7 to 2, so it went a smaller distance, um, it went a total of 5 here. So then your total there is 7 plus 5, so that would be 12. That should be your final answer. And it's distance, just distance, no change or anything. So it should be in, oh, this one was in meters, right? So hopefully if that makes sense. You want to just figure out when the particle stops, because that's when it could turn around. Um, and then you want to take each of those times separately, uh, the distance from each of those times separately. OK, so t equals 0. Yeah, and we made sure to get the units right on that. OK, so we have five minutes left. Are there any very quick questions or anything? Okay. Okay. Um, so, how about uh, I take a look at it after okay. we finish? Yeah, I'll take a look at it and see. Um, I think I went through this right. Let me double check. Find the total distance traveled by the body from t equals zero to t equal two. Yeah, so it traveled from zero to seven here, so that'd be seven, and then seven to two. This should be right. Yeah, okay, I'll take a look at it after. Um, okay, anything else? Any quick little, anything you want me to, any topics or anything, or? Do I need one more uh, Okay, yeah, sure, we can do that. 2.9, uh, we'll just do a quick linearization. Or, or even if you like, think of something that, like, I mean, that's very quick, and I can just think of me. Yeah. yeah, and did some examples. Oh, no, that was a different, that was a differential example. Uh, yeah, let's. Yeah, I mean, so on exams, something linearization, the hardest part is maybe if you're not doing a web work problem is dealing with when they're saying estimate a function value using linearization, it's kind of hard to figure out what they mean by like, what should I be plugging? Right? So if they give you something like you have a function, and your function is very easy to evaluate at one let's say. Um, so for example, that, that cosine one, cosine of pi over 6 times x, that's very easy to evaluate at 1. So you just plug in 1, you get cosine pi over 6. You can, you can figure that out. It's not too bad. Um, so let's say that this guy is easy. Well, f of something close to 1 might be hard. So like 1.1. That might be hard. So in this case, that would be trying to figure out cosine of pi over 6 times 1.1. And that's not easy. You're going to want a calculator for that or something. But if you want to estimate it, you can use linearization. And the way you do it is you linearize around your easy value. So in this case, 1 is easy. So we should, so this tells us, linearize around easy value. Uh, in this case, x equals 1. So then once we get our linearization, 
So remember, if we're linearizing around 1, we want the derivative at 1, x minus 1 plus f of 1. Well, this guy's easy to figure out. And hopefully the derivative should also be easy to figure out. It was in this cosine one, right? It was sine of pi over 6 or something. Uh, so we can actually fill this in and be OK. Uh, and then if we want to get it at our hard value, which is close to the easy value, so 1.1 was hard, but it's close to 1, we can just plug it in there. So L of 1.1 is equal to f prime of 1 times 1.1 minus 1 plus f of 1. So in this case, uh, this number right here should always be small, because that should be the distance between from the value you linearized around to the value you're looking at. So in this case, it's 0 0.1. That's pretty small. Plus f of 1. So then since you know what this guy is, you know what this guy is, you can multiply by 0 0.1 pretty easy. So then this will give you a good approximation for what f of 1.1 is. It won't give you the right value, not always, unless it's like a linear line, then it's, it'll give you the right thing. But it'll give you something close. Because if we're looking at something like this, and we, we know what it is at 1, and we really want what it is at 1.1, 1 .1, well, if we draw the line, the tangent line, which is what the linearization is, we can evaluate it here, and that might be kind of close to what it actually is. Um, so the hardest thing, I think, with linearizations is, is trying to figure out what you need to plug in. So just make sure you you figure out the x value that corresponds to the one you want. So in, like in the other one, they, they posed it to us as cosine of 5 pi over 24. And so you have to figure out what x value that means here. And we figured that out because we said that pi over 6 times x is equal to 5 pi over 24, and then solve for x. And so basically, it's just finding a very, finding something to be lower than very close to Exactly. Yep. So it's finding something you know that's very, very close, plugging it into the equation. I think that's a good summary of how to do that. All right. So I think that we'll call it for tonight. Uh, thanks for viewing. Thanks for coming. Um, good luck on the midterm. Keep working through your homework. There's that practice quiz, the practice exam. Um, Try going through those. It'll be good to get some practice. And uh, yeah, I think that's all. So thank you.